Welcome to part three on the new imperialism. Now we're going to look at 1848. In March of 1848, um, several groups of German liberal revolutionaries are going to rise up and call for a unified German state. There's going to be a problem with this, though, in that each of these different liberal groups in these different German states um, wanted something different out of this revolution. First of all, these revolutionaries really couldn't decide which German authority they wanted to fall under. At the time in Europe, there's two major Germanic powers. You had Prussia and you had Austria, right, the Austrians. And so they kind of were going back and forth, different groups wanting to uh, fall under the influence of one or the other. Uh, neither monarchy wanted to uh, uh, rule under any kind of liberal constitution, and neither one of these monarchs also wanted to be second place. To them, second place was only first loser. Okay, so delegates from all over Germany are going to meet in Frankfurt to try and hammer out all these differences. And after about a year of debate, they're going to offer a constitutional crown to uh, the Prussian uh, king, Frederick William IV, right? But William IV had seen the successes of the Austrian emperor in suppressing revolution inside of his own domain. And so as a result, he's going to refuse uh, this German crown, and so the issue of a German unification is going to be pushed off till later. 1848 also saw a unification movement in Italy. It was called the Risorgimento, right? And the Risorgimento was kind of a half uh, unification movement and also a movement to try and drive the Austrians out of Venetia. Right. Uh, so it's kind of a two pronged thing. Right. The revolts began actually back in January in Sicily, where nationalists and liberals uh, had wanted the Bourbon monarchies to push for a national unification and a liberal constitutional uh, uh, system. Right. So the revolts then began to spread north all the way to Venice. Right. Um, just as the German nationalists, the Italian nationalists couldn't really decide on who they should be united under, right? You had some that said they should unite under the Piedmont Sardinia uh, uh, state, others said under Venetia, which of course was controlled by the Austrian Empire. Some said it should be controlled by the Pope, others said the two uh, Sicilies should control it, right? Ultimately, the reaction to um, the uh, <clears throat> to the Resorg Resorgimento uh, is gonna make the decision for them, for example, the Austrians are going to crush the Venetian revolt, right? Uh, in the two Sicilies, the government is going to crush that revolt as well. The Pope is going to condemn the rebellion and then flee Rome, uh, matter of fact, causing for a brief time the declaration of a Roman Republic uh, by a radical nationalist by the name of Giuseppe Mazzini. Uh, Giuseppe uh, Mazzini is going to be supported by another Giuseppe, Giuseppe Garibaldi. Right. But in 1849, the French are going to intervene on the side of the Pope and crush this Roman Republic. Right. Only King Charles Albert of uh, Piedmont, Sardinia, embra embraced the, the Risorgimento. Right. Uh, and he attempted to support it. He enacted a liberal constitution and he tried to aid the Venetian rebels. But ultimately, he was defeated in 1849 by the Austrian army in the Battle of Norvara. And the idea of, uh, of a unified uh, Italy at that point came to an end for now. Finally, there was the 1848 revolutions inside the Austrian Empire itself. Aside from the anti-Austrian riots in Venetia, you're also going to have the Hungarians in Austria that are going to begin to revolt in the spring of 1848 uh, uh, for Hungarian home rule, right? Um, riots will actually break out amongst students in v uh, Vienna itself, and it's going to cause the Austrian government to at least temporarily flee to Innsbruck, right? Uh, as a result of this, a national assembly is going to be convened to draft a constitution, first passing the March laws, which are going to grant uh, Hungarians uh, in Hungary some self-government, semi-self-rule, uh, and abolishing the last vestiges of aristocratic privilege, uh, feudalism, and serfdom. <clears throat> However, in uh, Hungary, in the Hungarian side of the Austrian Empire, a national, 
nationalist named Lejos Kosuth is going to proclaim complete independence, all right? And by compl uh, declaring complete independence, uh, Kosuth is going to abolish serfdom and offend the local landlords. He's also not going to offer anything to the Czechs and the Serbs, the Croats, and the Romanians, who also made up a large percentage of the population in that region of the empire, right? So gradually, the Austrian monarch begins to reassert himself. He's a young, new monarch, just takes the throne there in 1848 by the name of Franz Joseph. Uh, we'll actually talk about him again because he's uh, um, also the uh, emperor of Austria in World War I. Right. But he's going to begin reasserting, reasserting himself. He's going to mobilize his army under uh, Count Josef Rodetsky. Uh, and uh, Rodetsky uh, uh, is going to begin crushing this rebellion. Right. Uh, Rodetsky is going to gather allies amongst the aforementioned minorities in Hungary that had uh, been ignored or pushed around by Kosuth. And together they're going to crush the rebellion first in Italy and then move it and crush it there in uh, Austria. In 1849, that National Assembly is dissolved and a new authoritarian constitution is imposed that's going to uh, be made until maintained until the 1860s when finally Franz Joseph will agree to some semi uh, a, a dual monarchy for the Hungarians in what was what will be called the Ausgleich. There are six lessons that we can draw from the failure of the revolutions of 1848. First is that liberalism and nationalism and to some lesser degree socialism were important and to some extent viable movements, especially in Central and Southern Europe. But to the second point, there's also the fact that the revolutions failed. And that tells us that the Ancien regime still has a great deal of, of residual strength, even though it's, like I said, it's kind of antiquated, right? And that's because there's little unity on that nationalism and liberal, liberalism front. You have the different groups attracted uh, to one or another of these movements, but there's nothing that really binds them all together. There's nothing to create a collective revolution like what Karl Marx had hoped to see, right? Uh, for example, you're going to have liberal intellectuals who want governmental reform, universal ma male suffrage, and freedom of the press. But then you'll also have a, a middle class, but they, they want government reform and the vote for themselves and economic equality. Then you have the working class who wants the vote for them and social welfare programs. And then, of course, then you just have the peasantry who just want land. Um, none of these programs by themselves have a chance unless they unite together. The third point is that that's significant about these revolutions is what happens to the radicals themselves, right? They were often proscribed in their own countries and forced, and many of them were forced to immigrate. Many of them ended up in the United States, in fact, where they would be instrumental for helping to form radical movements there, right? The fourth lesson from this is that before the liberal issues can be solved in uh, in the Europe, the in Europe, the national issues had to be solved. So. That means before Germany or Italy or Austria-Hungary could enact any kind of liberal constitutions, first you had to sort out whether or not they were going to be countries at all and in what form they're going to take. Are you going to have a unified Italy? Are you going to have a unified Germany? Is Hungary going to have home rule? Things like that, right? Basically the same things that France and Britain had already gone through in the previous centuries, right? Uh, Fifth, given that unification in, is a, in, in the national issue is, the, is uh, of top priority, that means that unification is going to have to come from the top down. So that means it's really doubtful that you're going to have the creation of liberal democracies out of this. You're going to need to have some focal point, a powerful king or a great leader to imply that nationalistic sentiment before you get any kind of constitutional or, or, liber, or liberal constitution uh, established. And then finally, it's clear that German and Italian unification is going to depend a great deal on what happens in Austria, the Austrian Empire, right? Because it has such a major influence on both, it's going to be the key. And so for once, Europe's future lay in what happens in the East and in the South instead of the West, which it had been since the fall of the Roman Empire.